Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, continuing off on my last video, I'm talking about how greenhouse gases vary with altitude in the atmosphere. Okay, so at what altitude, for example, are the concentrations the maximum? Um, if the greenhouse gases are sourced at the surface, like from emissions from you know, cities with high industry or hot spots, for example, over the ocean, you know, um, if there's methane releases from permafrost, et cetera, we can identify from the surface measurements where the methane is coming from and from the examination of the satellite measurements at the different elevations or different la altitudes, we can see how the concentrations vary and therefore how, learn something about how they're dispersed by the uh, wind patterns, the global wind patterns. So I'm looking at methane. In the last video, I started looking at uh, methane. So this is, uh, this is I infrared atmospheric sounding interferometer data, I IASI data. And you can go down here and you can select the data set that you'd like to look at. So I went to mixing ratio of methane and I selected, there's two satellites and two different time intervals. So I selected MEDOP2, 12 to 24 Zulu, and I was looking at these, um, you know, the variations of methane. And one thing that you can notice, for example, is around halfway up the atmosphere, you know, the maximum levels that, um, that were seen on this particular day, December 16th, 27, 27 ppb, you know, and these numbers, th these numbers are you know, in the pink here, they're up in the Arctic region. And if we see if we can find it, a, a, uh, we, if we step off here, 2728 again, 2728, and look for where it drops off, 2729. Okay, uh, we'll go right down here, 20. 690. So it, it's dropped off there. Okay, so the high, highest levels are up here. Let's go the other way. Let's have a look here. And it's dropped off there. Okay, so you can kind of 2727 is the highest. Okay, so I highly recommend that you have a look at these. And, you know, you can learn a lot of different things about the um, how, how, how the gas varies with altitude over the globe. Okay, now did the same thing for CO2. Okay, the mixing ratio ratio of CO2. So up really really super high in the atmosphere. The levels are just over between 402 roughly and 405. Okay, so they're dispersed evenly around the planet according to this. Now, as we go closer and closer to the surface, I'm looking for changes here. So what you can see is, um, you can see purples appearing. Okay, so the levels are now high. So as you go down, um, we're at 400, 400 odd millibar. Okay, so this is about six, seven kilometers up into the atmosphere. And what you can see is the levels are elevated at the in the Arctic for the most part. And then the levels drop off and then they're elevated a bit more in the uh, Southern Hemisphere near Antarctica as well. Okay, uh, we can go right down to the surface here. And what you can see is you can see the variation here, 373 to 420. The values, the pink values are the highest up in the Arctic and some in the Southern Hemisphere also. Okay, so you can actually see how the gas varies with elevation. Okay, uh, if we look at water vapor, okay, now when water vapor is broken down, the hydrogen is pulled off and you can get the hydroxyl radical, OH star, in an excited state. And it's very, very reactive. It reacts with methane, produces CO2 and water thereby acting as a sink, removing CO2, removing uh, methane from the atmosphere. So this is very high levels, um, up, up in the, uh, you know, very, very high levels, very, very low pressure, very little water vapor, and it's dispersed uniformly. So 
So let's just look uh, as we go down in, as we go closer and closer to the surface. There's not much change. Um, this is, you know, let's pick a number. This is about, uh, this is 700 roughly millibar. So it's just over three kilometers high. You can see there is a larger variation. There'll be almost no water vapor. This is in parts per thousand, if you like, grams of water vapor per kilograms of air. Uh, very low levels of very small amounts of water vapor up, up at the poles. Um, the highest levels are near the equator. Um, the mean is 2.35, highest is 16.6 .6 parts per thousand or grams per kilogram. And so that would be in this region straddling the equator. Okay, as we go lower and lower, and we get to the surface, then this is the type of distribution that we see. So very little water vapor in the polar regions, highest in the near the equator. OK, and that's to be expected. The water temperatures are higher. There's more evaporation, more water vapor, up to 29 grams of H2O per kilogram of air. And you can see that the levels are the highest um, here um, over the oceans, dropping um, over the continents a bit. And, go, you know, so between minus 30, uh, 30 degrees south, 30 degrees north, most of the water vapor is concentrated in that region. Now, if we look at ozone, we're going to see a different picture. So ozone levels are very low. And look how they're rising here. OK, they're, they're rising in this region. So between about 2.7 millibar, say, and about 16 millibar, the levels are the highest. And then they drop back off, okay, as you go closer to the surface. Okay, this is exactly what we expect because we know that, uh, we know that ozone, the, the ozone layer is, is up in the high stratosphere. Okay, pressure is about 10 millibar or so. So if we go to our graph of the atmosphere. This is 50 millibar. This will be about 10 millibar. You know, we're talking about 30, 40. You know, the ozone layers are up in this region, 30, 40 kilometers. That's where the ozone layers level is the highest. And we can actually see that from our data. So this is a range 3,170 to 12,450 ppb. This is 10 to the fourth PPB roughly, so the you know the very hot the red levels here are straddling the equator and then dropping off as you get closer to the poles. Okay, so that's what we see with ozone. You can also get information on cloud tops. You can get the pressure at the cloud tops, and that gives you the elevation, allows you to get the the elevation of the clouds and the, the fraction of clouds. You can also get things to do with uh, radiation fluxes and stuff, but I'm not going to go into um, those uh, to, in much detail. But basically, um, you heat up we, we, the green. The, the solar radiation is short wave radiation mostly from the sun, heats up the surface of the Earth. Okay, the Earth, the, the Earth then re radiates that heat. Um, as long-wave radiation. So this is measuring, the satellite is measuring the long-wave radiation that's coming up from the surface of the Earth. And uh, you can see, you know, the hotter regions here near the equator are obviously um, that more, more and more heat is coming from the surface of the Earth in the hotter regions, straddling the equator. And as you get to the poles, there's less and less. But you can get uh, uh, you can get the um, spatial distribution, and you measure from measurements that are taken every day. You can get the temporal distribution, and you can determine, um, for example, thing you know, determine how clouds are are trapping heat, how lack of clouds are letting heat up, how the um, the type of clouds is very important. Certain regions have low-level clouds; other regions tend to have more serious clouds, high-level clouds. So you can get that information to to get a good uh, picture of, of what's happening on the planet. Now, I just wanted to point out, this is, uh, this is my uh, Twitter feed, Paul H. Beckwith. Follow me if you're 
not already doing so. I just pinned this tweet recently about the latest greenhouse gas levels in our atmosphere for methane, CO2, and N2O, nitrous oxide. Okay, and I just point out that until these rises halt, we know that climate change will worsen policy conferences like COP24 in Poland will have again failed and humanity is not dealing with the climate crisis. So what we have is we have CO2 levels, parts per million rising. And you can see this is not a linear curve. You know, these take out the seasonal, the yearly variation, which is the ups and downs here. You know, and the red line is the trend. And this is not linear. This is exponentially rising. This is the year to year. This is a growth rate, PPM rise per year. And you can see you know, we're over three here. There is fluctuation, but the trend is, is irreversibly up at the moment, and we have to stop that. This is methane here, the stalling out and in the stalling out in this period here, and then the rise again in 2007. And you can see that the stalling out here and the rise here. Okay, so there is fluctuation. You know, it was very high here, 12, 13 PPM, PPB rise per year. Uh, here we had about 10 or 11, you know, and so according to this, you know, if we do get an episodic methane release from the Arctic, this is going to skyrocket up and this is going to skyrocket up and we'll be, you know, in deep trouble in terms of growing food for people around the world because the weather disruptions will greatly increase. This is uh, nitrous oxide, you know, inexorable rise here. You know, and the trend is, you know, it's not quite, it's a bit above linear. I mean, this, if it was linear, this would be a line, you could draw a line straight across here, flat, but we could draw a trend line. And so N2O is also increasing. Now, based on, now the global warming potential is of these gases, CO2 is defined as one. Okay, methane is much more powerful greenhouse gas you know, on a short time scale of a year or two, it's 150 to 200 times more powerful than CO2. Averaged over 20 years, it's 86 times more powerful. And averaged over 100 years, it's 34 times more powerful. Nitrous oxide has a fairly long lifetime in the atmosphere, and its global warming potential is about 300. Now, fortunately, the concentrations of these gases are much lower than CO2, but the rise is contributing significant amounts to climate change and global warming. So I just want to show one more thing. The Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii is where it's got the longest record of CO2. It's got the world's oldest continuous monitoring CO2 station. It's the world's primary benchmark site for measurement of the gas. So if you see um, a measurement of CO2, a number for CO2, you know, in the atmosphere, or a number for methane or nitrous oxide or these other things, and it doesn't say where it's from, it's likely from this Mauna Loa site. So why stick it on a mountain in Hawaii, a you know, a volcano for that matter? When a volcano erupts, of course, it produces lots of CO2. Okay, so here is the, uh, here is the configuration of the Mauna Loa Observatory. Um, this is the summit. Okay, so this observatory is, these are 100 meter contour lines. Why do volcanic emissions from the summit rarely reach the observatory? because the observatory is on the northern slope of the mountain, six kilometers away from and 800 meters lower than the summit. Okay, most of the time the winds are from the northeast. Okay, so the winds will be from the northeast. Northeasterly trade winds. Okay, so they're blowing the air from the ocean up the mountain past the observatory. And if there's outgassing from the peak, it will be blown away. Only when there's, there, only on a small percentage of nights do the winds become light and southerly. Okay, if they're from the south, then that'll push the volcanic emissions to the observatory.